Today I'm with Martin Johnson and his wife Julie from Martin Johnson Off Grid Living and today we're going to be talking with them about power and water resiliency. big push for my homestead this year is going to, of course, continuing doing food production, but I also want to get into being more resilient with my energy and water supplies. I thought, who better to talk to than these guys right here because they are living completely off grid. So they have agreed to meet with me today and go over some of the systems they have in place so I can maybe get a better idea of what I need to do for my place. Martin and Julie, so can you guys tell us real quick a little bit about yourselves and what you guys are doing on your YouTube channel? Sure, we are uh, building an off-grid homestead from scratch, debt-free. Uh, up here in North Idaho, we've been on the property for about- Almost two years. Yeah, almost two years. We're still like in the building up stage. We really want to get to the stage where we have animals and you know, a good garden and fruit trees and all of that, but we're just not there yet. I am on grid. Yep. I have normal electricity, but I have been susceptible to power outages mm -hmm. and right. uh, I do a lot of animal production, which means I have a lot of meat in the freezer. Mm -hmm. So I am interested in learning more about building up just a backup system. Uh -huh. So I'm not necessarily looking to go off grid full time. That would be cool, but yeah. maybe down the road, but right now where I am, financially and what I can do. Uh, I want to learn more about a backup system. So I was wondering if you guys can maybe talk a little bit about your system that you sure. have. And I know you guys are full-time off-grid, but maybe like what concepts we can take from that and, and apply that to what would work for a backup yeah, system. Yeah, absolutely. See, our solar array has grown over the past two years that we were here. We started off with just four panels generating a thousand watts. Then we bumped it up to eight panels and around 2,000 watts, and now we're at 10 panels. And so we can generate 3,000 watts uh, in full sun, basically. When it's cloudy like today, we'll look inside how much we're making, but I bet it's not over 500 watts on a cloudy day. Do you have to supplement with your generator with that? Yeah, we, well, we will. We could run probably three or four days, I bet, on cloudy with days. cloudy days yeah. using electricity like we normally would. And um, in three or four days, we'll have to We'll have to start up the generator and charge up the batteries. So we're in the shed now, which is where you have your battery bank and your charge controller and yep. all the fun stuff. So we have eight Battleborn batteries here. These are 12 volt batteries, but they're wired in series and then in parallel. So they're actually 24 volts. This is the inverter that we use to actually run everything inside of the house. So a lot of people that I don't know about anymore, but it used to be that a lot of people that lived off grid would have 12 volt lights and 12 volt appliances and things like that. But the inverters have gotten so efficient now and, and so good that you could just run your house off of regular power, like by regular appliances, as long as they're energy efficient and use them in your house. Two charge controllers from the solar panels. And like right now, even though it's a cloudy day, we're generating, we're adding 523 watts to the batteries. So everything we're running in the house, which would be um, a 15 cubic foot refrigerator, I think a 10 cubic foot um, deep freezer, chest freezer, the lights, we got like computers are probably plugged in and um, the internet, we have a wireless internet, you know, that goes through the cell system. That's on, the router's on, and then the lights in here basically, that'd be about it right now. It's, it's actually running. So I'm guessing probably right now there's around 150 watts in the house unless the refrigerators happen to be running. Um, but we're generating, putting 160 or 560 watts back into the battery, so that's good. As far as, as what we do, we run all the lights we wanna run. We run the TV, we have a big, you know, big flat TV and uh, internet and regular refrigerator, you know? So basically everything that we need we can run off of this system. Julie, oh. he, he said everything you need, but <laughs> as a lady, are there certain things that a lady might need in addition, mm -hmm. or really, really, really like that maybe you've had to do without because of? I'm trying to think. I think at times I've thought about 
wanting to use a crock pot okay and haven't just because of the energy that it uses um but i mean there's a lot of ways around that um you know just cooking slower on the stove it's not that difficult to Brazier. adjust to yeah i think a lot of ladies use blow dryers mm -hmm. i don't so that's not a big deal for me but that would be one thing that would take a lot of electricity a clothes dryer yeah, clothes dryer. We don't um, run a clothes dryer. So yeah, that's actually a sacrifice. <laughs> so Marty, what kind of batteries are those? These are actually lithium iron phosphate batteries. Um, a lot of people run lead acid batteries or flooded lead acid batteries. They are way less expensive than these, but these are way less maintenance, as in zero maintenance. Hook them up and you're done, right? Uh, there's, there's a couple concerns, I guess, some is low temperature concerns. Only a couple times this year did they get a little bit too cold. It doesn't hurt them. They have a battery management system inside of each one of these batteries. And so it actually just shuts off the battery. And it won't, it, it like helps protect it so that it doesn't damage itself. Yeah, so when we first started, we just went to Batteries Plus and, and picked up golf cart batteries. I think these batteries here are around $150 each. In my circumstances where I just want to run two to three freezers mm -hmm. in a prolonged outage to keep meat from spoiling and maybe just some lights okay so i can right. see at night right what kind of system would you recommend like how much of a system let me start right. there would i need just to be able to meet that minimum sort of um goal there so what, what i would really recommend that you do is you purchase a kilowatt it's called kill a watt device and basically what you're going to do is you're going to plug that into the wall and then you're gonna take your freezer cord and you're gonna plug it into the kilowatt. And you're gonna let it run for 24 hours, just like set the stopwatch or set an alarm on your phone and let it run for 24 hours under normal conditions. Like if you're cleaning it out or something, then that's gonna throw it way off, but under normal conditions and then see how many watts it used in a 24 hour period. I mean like light bulbs are really easy to figure out because you know how many watts it uses and how long it's on. But with a refrigerator or a freezer, it goes on and off by itself all the time. And so it's really hard to calculate how much energy that's gonna use in a 24 hour period, right? So plug that in, it'll calculate it all for you. It'll tell you how much you need per day to run that, that appliance. Then just do that to each one of the appliances that you want to run and find out how many watts you need for a day. I have no idea what the numbers would be, but let's just say you're gonna run, you're gonna need a thousand watts, right? A thousand watt hours per day to run what you want to run. So however many days, let's just say you're, you only want one day of backup power, right? Well, you need a battery bank then that can hold 1000 watts of power. And if you're using flooded lead acid batteries, you're really only supposed to use 50% of that. So you're going to want one that can hold 2000 watts of power in the batteries so that you can get one day of backup. For your panels, those are going to give you so many watts per hour, right, of, of direct sunlight. And so if you if you want to size it for like worst case scenario, that's going to be like the super cloudiest days in the winter. So maybe you're going to get a quarter of what the panel is actually rated for. So then if you want to gauge it for winter, then you want to, you want to do that for four times as much, right? For the winter. The number one thing that I think you need to do first is find out how much power you need per day to run all of your stuff. And then from there, you can calculate out all the rest, but you need to know you need to know your needs before you can figure out what you what you need it's to generate that power. So tell me about your water system here. We have a 2,500 gallon uh, storage tank or cistern that we use to store our water. We used to haul water off of our from town to here and put it in this tank, but now that we have a well, we just pump from the well into here. We buried it three feet in the ground and then piled the dirt up from the hole around it. So it's about four feet in the ground. Yep. It's, it's actually- It's taller than you. Yeah, it's taller than yeah. me. If it's you're just standing next to this on the ground, like at the Home Depot parking lot, <laughs> it's like this tall, <laughs> right? So we can open it up and take a look because one of the concerns of having a tank like this is whether or not it's going to freeze, right? Right. In our cold climate yeah, that's yeah. a concern and we just had a really like hard freeze or for a few days now yeah we we for example last week were in the negatives with wind chill yeah, yeah. and so we haven't opened this since before it was freezing like that so i don't have no idea what it looks like in here all right well let's or take a look or how much water yeah oh wow okay there you go so it's it is 
There's some ice in there. But as you can see it, so it, it it's sinking down with the water. Hmm. So there's a layer of ice at the top. Yeah. yeah. And actual water that you can still use beneath it that your pump's getting out. Yep. Huh. Yeah. Even with that ice that's on the top of the tank, we don't have any problem actually pumping water out into the house because it draws from the bottom of the tank. And then so as the water goes down in the tank, the ice can, can go down with it. And then if we filled this up again like right now, the water coming out of the well is what it gonna be like 40 degrees mm -hmm. around there. So it would melt a lot of that ice as we filled it back up. Yeah. So in the bottom of the tank, there that's where the pump is, and then no, it, the pump is actually in the crawl space under the house. Oh, and it's like drawing yeah, the water it in. It. Uh -huh. Okay. So the bottom of the tank or near the bottom has a fitting that's just like this, and so um, the pipe connects to here, and then it runs underground, three feet underground, goes underneath the house, and then there's a a pressure tank and a and a pump underneath the house that pressurizes it for the house. So when I first talked about on my channel that uh, I wanted to do something like this, that, that this seemed like a, a good backup system, because right. again, I am I have water already. I have community water, I don't have a well. That's susceptible to failure, but it's not common. But I just wanted a, a backup water supply for when it does go down. Um, so somebody did suggest, well, why don't you drill a well? Well, I was just watching your well video recently, <laughs> and do uh, you want to talk about the cost of that real quick? Yeah, we just dug a well, and it was we went down 520 feet, and the total cost of that was around $33,000. So that's not a little bit of money. And so if you don't have to drill a well, if you have another source of water, I would say use that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I do not have $33,000 right now. So uh, this seems, I don't know how much this costs. Uh, yeah, I think it's about $1,000, I think. Okay. Yeah. About $1,000 for the tank. And did you have to hire an excavator? Is that something you do yourself? We, did, we dug with a shovel. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. All four of us. Yeah. It took a day, you know, okay. but we dug it all out with a shovel and, and a pick. And mm -hmm. Tank's 1000 then the pump. Yeah, the pump was, we got the pump at um, the co-op and it was, I'm guessing 200, probably around there, somewhere with a pressure tank. Wow. Yeah. Okay. But you could do like, if, if you didn't want to trench to it and you just wanted to draw water out of the top, then you could use a portable pump, you know, or um, you could use one of those, like a sump pump or a, yeah, like a sump pump where you drop the whole pump in there, hook a garden hose to it and shh, run the garden hose out you know Perfect. you don't have to you wouldn't have to trench it right since it would only be for backup emergency circumstances yep. yeah all you cool. care is having a source of water right mm -hmm. so cool I think that would, that's the way i think i would i would probably would want to do it Let's see what happens here oh yeah yeah so it's loose in there But it is pretty thick, that's wow. for sure. In case anyone's freaking out that Marty just put a dirty rake in his water drinking supply, they do have a filter inside, that's pretty good, <laughs> right? Yeah, we do, it's all, it's, the drinking water is filtered. So Marty and Julie, thank you guys so much sure. for having me out and let Absolutely. me cool see your, you. yeah, thanks. And, and it's really helpful for me to get an idea of the direction I'm moving forward. If people want to learn more about you guys and the adventure you're on, how can they go to do that? Uh, well, you can check us out on YouTube at uh, Martin Johnson Off Grid Living, or you could check out our website, which is downtheearthhomesteaders.com. Thanks, oh. guys. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank Thanks you for, for coming, coming out. Yeah. <laughs>